About 1,700,000 Poles were deported to the Soviet Union and were disseminated by this evil empire. And after a year, maybe a year and a half, half of them had died. Because in general, people were not totally prepared for such hard living conditions. And in addition, there were no men. They deported families of those who were arrested already, or jailed somewhere earlier, or killed already. So mainly they were women and children and old people. They were not able to organize and adapt, adjust their lives to those terrible conditions. My family was deported to Kazakhstan. I remember the name of this locality. Semipalatinskaya Oblast, in the Kopitinsky region. Kolhos Bolshevik, second farm. It was 95 miles from the nearest train station, close to the border with China, the place where the Chinese would later explode their atom bombs. We were there literally, on the plains about 60 miles from the border with China. It was a desert. There was nothing. They brought us to the Genghis Tobe station. They asked us to get out there. It had taken us two weeks to travel to this place. When we got there, there was no place to live. There were stables from which they had driven out the cattle for the summer pastures. In those stables, there was half a meter of manure, which had to be cleaned out first, before we could move in. This manure was very valuable, precious treasure, which could be used later, in the winter, as fuel. We cut it into blocks, placed it outside to dry, and stored it until the winter, when we used it as fuel to keep us warm and to cook. There was no wood, only reeds. The reeds looked like bamboo. They called it kamish. And they were mostly women and children. They had to give them something to do. So they had the idea to build an airport. The ground had to be cleaned of bushes to make it even. So people were literally smoothing over the ground. Those who worked got food stamps for bread. For children, 14 ounces. For adults, working adults, 21. For hard-working adults, 32 ounces. It was the one and only official source of food there for the people. To add to this, we had to sell everything we had brought with us. We exchanged things with the people who had been deported there earlier, and somehow we managed to survive. We exchanged for milk, flour, sugar. Later, when they learned that our aunt was a dentist, they asked us to move to the closest little town called Kopecht. She agreed on one condition. Only if we, my mother, my brother and I, could go with her. They agreed. So we moved to this little town, and there my mom and my aunt rented a room from a Russian man who worked bringing and selling water to people. He had a mule and a barrel on his carriage. He took water from the river and distributed it, selling buckets of water to people. In the winter he had a sleigh with a barrel on it and distributed the water in this way. I remember the winter of 1940-41 was very severe, and Kopecht was literally cut off from the rest of the world. 
The snow was so high that nobody could get to it. Hunger was in command, so he had to kill his mule. He had a large family, and he also had to give part of the meat to the other people. Soon his mule was eaten up. Only the skin was left. So he started to eat this skin. We exchanged. He had a daughter. Her husband was in the army. She had two kids. The kids got sick when they ate the skin. They were in pain and throwing up. So she wanted to exchange a piece of mule skin for something else. In this period, before the war between the Russians and the Germans, we got eight or maybe nine packages from our acquaintances in Poland. They sent us crackers, tobacco, groats. Those packages were so thrown around that everything inside of them turned into powder, a mix of crackers and tobacco. But we didn't throw it out. And when we didn't have anything else to eat, my mother poured out this mix, and my brother and I pulled out small pieces of tobacco from the powder, so that only the crackers were left. And we made small cakes out of this. It was our food. So when our landlord's daughter learned that we had such a supply, she wanted us to exchange a piece of the mule skin for a few handfuls of this powder from the packages. My mom made the exchange, and I remember this mule skin was burnt. There wasn't any hair on it. We cut it into the strips and cooked it, and the result was a kind of jello with noodles in it. We ate it and chewed it. Years later, when I saw the Charlie Chaplin movie where he ate his shoes, I thought about us chewing on that mule skin. Those are my memories. The winter was horrible. Our house was totally under the snow. It was piled up exactly as high as the roof. We woke up one morning in total darkness and couldn't get out of the house. But our neighbors dug us out. They dug out the door along the wall and then we could open it.